Parker, a senior agriculture education student at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. And this is my Agriculture Education 501 Micro Teaching Learning Activity. The world is made up of 75% water, but of that 75%, only 2% is drinkable water. Water is a precious resource. Today, we'll discuss how we as humans poison this precious resource with our day-to-day -day activities. Pollution is defined by Wright and Vorse in the textbook Environmental Science Towards a Sustainable Future as the presence of a substance in the environment that, because of its chemical composition or quantity, prevents the functioning of natural processes and produces undesirable environmental and health effects. Water pollution occurs in two ways, non-point source and point source. Point source pollution is discharged from factories, sewage systems, power plants, underground coal mines, and oil wells. Non-point sources are difficult to define, but the most prominent is pollution from agricultural production processes. Non-point sources are very difficult to regulate when compared to point sources. Here's a demonstrative story that will show you exactly how pollution works. Who polluted the Potomac? For many thousands of years, people have lived on the banks of the Potomac River. They hunted in the forests, harvested food from wetlands, and caught fish in the river. Question. Imagine that the tub of water in front of you was taken from the Potomac River by a Native American 500 years ago. Describe how it looks to you. Would you drink this water, eat the fish that live in it, or even swim in it? One of the first explorers to visit the river kept the journal of his discoveries. He wrote about the Native American villages and the tributaries of sweet water. And seeing so many fish that him and his men tried to scoop them up with a frying pan. Soon, colonists began to arrive. They found fertile land for farming, forests teeming with wildlife, and a river that provided ample food and water. It was an outstanding environment for settlement, and the colonists prospered. How do you think the colonists used the river? Do we use the river in the same ways today? The river has changed a lot since it was first explored. This is the story of those changes. Years went by, and occasional storms drenched the area. High winds whipped through, and the trees blew leaves into the water. Gradually, the city of Washington, D.C. grew on the banks of the Potomac. Developers cleared wetlands and forests to build the houses and businesses. Rains washed loose soil from construction sites into the river. Is the water still safe to drink? Would you swim in it? Is it safe for wildlife? Three. At first, the city of Washington, D.C. was small. Upstream farmers planted crops to feed the city's growing population. Some of these crops grew right up against the banks of the river. The fertilizer washed off into the land and into the water. Other farmers kept pigs and other animals in their barnyard. As rainwater drained out of the barn, it carried some of the manure into the little creek behind the farm, the creek that flows directly into the Comic River. Would you drink this water now? Would you swim in it? Go boating in it? Is it safe for wildlife? As the city grew, more and more people began to move to the nearby countryside. These rural houses are not connected to the city's sewer system. Wastewater from the houses flows into the septic tanks under the ground, one homeowner has not maintained the septic tank and poorly treated sewage sweeped into the river. <laughs> to meet the electricity needs of the city, area officials decided that they would need to generate more power. Far upstream, a coal mine was dug. Rainwater drained down the mine shaft and soaked up piles of waste and scraps for mining. This made the rainwater more acidic, sort of like a strong vinegar. Then the acid water trickled back into the river. To burn the coal and produce the power, an electric power plant was built along the river. Gases coming out of the smokestacks combined with moisture from the air with the acids. The pollutant falls back to earth as acid rain or smog. Would you drink this water now? Would you swim in it? 
Would you eat the fish that live in it? Is it safe for wildlife? Now, Washington, D.C. is one of the largest metropolitan areas in the country. Traffic congestion is a big problem for commuters who drive their cars to and from work. Car exhaust fumes, just like power plant fumes, cause acid rain. If a car is not kept in good repair, it might also leak oil or other fluids, which will be washed off the pavement and into the river. And how do these residents of the city and the suburbs spend their time? In one neighborhood, lots of gardeners are out working on their yards. Many of them are using weed killers and insect sprays to keep the lawns very pretty. The next rain will wash all these poisons into the little creek nearby. And then into the river. One father is teaching his daughter how to change the antifreeze in their truck. They pour out the used antifreeze into the driveway. Antifreeze is sweet tasting and can poison the animals that lick it. It can also get into the nearby creek and poison the fish. Nearby, a boy washes the family car. The soapy water rushes down the driveway into the storm drain and the storm drain empties into the river. The grease and the grime on the car contains asphalt from the roads, asbestos from the brakes, rubber particles from the tires, toxic metals, and rust. If the boy had gone to a local car wash, the water had been treated before it returned to the river. Next door, a family is cleaning out their garage. They find an old rusty can with a tattered skull and crossbones label stuck, stuck on it. What could it be? It looks dangerous and they want to get rid of it before something gets hurt. But how? Junior gets an idea. Let's pour it down the drain by the curb. So, the mysterious liquid goes down the storm drain and the poison is out of sight, but it's headed for the river. On nice days, many people head down to the river. Some zoom up and down the river in motorboats and don't notice that the little engine oil leaks into the water. A group of friends have spread blankets on the shore for a beach party, and lots of families are picnicking. They leave trash behind on the beach, and it's swept into the river. A person fishing snags a hook on a log and breaks off the nylon fishing line, and this also ends up in the Potomac. So who polluted the Potomac, I ask? Everyone played a large role in the pollution of the Potomac, and this is what we do to our lakes and rivers every day. So the next time you flush a toilet, go on a family picnic, go fishing, put antifreeze in your car, go gardening, or commute to work, think of how you play a role in pollution.